Okay, so uh, where were we? Um, we were in the middle of, so, so uh, we know, we remember, recall, that if we look at GL1, I'm tr I can't not write two, GL1 of the Adele's mod GL1Q, right? Which is, which is just the Edel's modulo, the multiplicative rationals. We know that this is uh, zero to infinity. I'll write that as in a funny way, GL1R mod GL1Z, also known as uh, R mod Z, R cross mod Z cross, also known as zero to infinity. Cross, uh, again, let me write it in a funny way, GL1ZP, also known as ZP cross. The invertible one by one. We uh, sing zero to infinity. Oh, just because it's modding up, oh. Z, Z is, is, is doing exactly that. Yeah. I was just sort of mixing up with so, so this is a funny way to think about what's happening in the Edels that we that we looked at a long time ago, and now we're in the middle of now we're trying to understand uh, what happens for GL two of the Edels modulo GL two of Q. And let me be a little um, careful because we're going to have a lot of different kinds of embeddings. So, of course, here I'm talking about the diagonal embedding, where I can put GL two Q into the reals, into the two addicts, into the three addicts. And so the question is, what is this? Is dyadic, I mean, sorry, embedding diagonal embedding on the matrices coordinate wise. That's right. Diagonal. That's right. Each entry, each meet. So again, it's do you want to look at the entries as Adele's and GL2 on Adele's, or do you want to think of each matrix is a matrix in that ring, in that field, and then you have this list of matrices. So we want to be able to have the flexibility to do both. So however you want to think about it, it's still embedding that one rational matrix can be embedded into GL, GL2R, GL2, Q2, Q3. Okay. Yeah, so, I, so I guess when you work more locally, it's nice to have the, uh, oh, this is a sequence of matrices. That's right. That's right. Like you, you, know, you, you might look in that place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's let's recall what we did. We start with so we're given any g in g l two a. The first thing we did is we we used we used this decomposition to say that there's a rational number, there's a non-zero rational number, so that the um, given any g in g l two a, uh, there exists a q in. Um, Q in the rationals, in fact, the invertible rationals, and there exists an X in the reals, X in zero infinity, uh, and there exists, uh, let's say, U. U will be the I. I want to I want to say that we're in uh, we're in this. U is in um, the product of ZP crosses, such that. If I take G and I multiply it by, okay, so now let's be careful about the embedding. Um, Q, I'll embed diagonally. X, I'll embed in the infinite place, or rather, let me just define a, uh, an, uh, an, a, a GL, an element of GL2A for you. I'll put the X here and I'll put U, two here and U3 and so on. Uh, this is my matrix GL, G1. Why do you have to specify the, the disembedding in the diagonal? What, what is the other, what's another interpretation? Here? You could just put it at the infinite place. Right, yeah, that, that or you could put it only at uh, you could have the identity and then at the at the peak place you put q q001 or the finite embedding yeah just put it in the finite in fact this what i'm really doing here is the product of the infinite this let me point out is the infinite embedding of uh the matrix x inverse 001 times 
the finite embedding of the matrix U, of the matrix, well, I have to make it a matrix, U inverse 0, 0, 1. So the finite embedding is all but the infinite places. Here, there's only one infinite place. So, so these are the finite places, the places P less than infinity. And, in the real slot. So in the real slot, you just put the identity. And then for the other ones, I have U2 inverse U3 inverse and so on. Here I'm putting only this at the real place and identity matrices everywhere else. And so the product will give and their product will give me this thing. So this is something that's going to have determinant one. One, 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 one. Okay, so G1 is in SL2A. Then we saw strong approximation. Strong approximation, uh, which actually is a much more general theorem than uh, what we've discussed. There's the strong approximation theorem just for Zariski dense groups. Um, let me not go, go there, but it's an important on the topic of things that where where I don't have HECA operators and when I don't have L functions, I still have strong approximation. These weird groups that uh, where you can't do number theory, you can still do this much of the number theory. Yes. Why So whatever the determinant of G was, such that uh, determinant of G is equal to uh, the diagonal embedding of Q times the infinite embedding of X times the finite embedding of U. So that's, the that's exactly this. Numbers. That's exactly this quotient. Yes, that's coming. That's coming. Okay, so I just multiplied by these things to make the determinant exactly equal to one. One meaning the sequence of ones. Yep. I'm just making it into a matrix in order to multiply. Then this is dense in uh, SL2 of the Adels. This is the Chinese remainder theorem, a very fancy Chinese remainder theorem. And again, this is uh, much more general. You don't need the full uh, group. This is this is something about Zariski dense subgroups of uh, semi simple groups. I mean, this is diagonal. Like, the, the real place you just slap on. I, I have an, yeah, I have an embedding of Q into the reals. Because the reals are also a sequence. So I have the constant sequence, yeah, right? Everything. Reals are Cauchy sequences of rationals up to equivalence. So are p -addicts. Just the notion of equivalence changing. Yeah, so, so if you're thinking about how to formalize this, it's... Uh, it, it's we use these things like they're very simple objects and they are but you know as long as you don't really look under the hood too for too long <laughs> or get really good api right we have really good api for how to deal with these things as humans um okay so the strong approximation in sl2 of the adels tells me that well i can't get g1 on the nose but i can get nearby g1 so let's get nearby g1 uh, how do I get nearby G1? So G1 times something that's uh, an, an approximation to the identity. In So I have some epsilons, I think we were calling them last time. So each of these is in uh, SL, SL2ZP. Well, this one is in the sense of analysis. This one is just in the sense of, I want to take an, if I have an open set around some, some point in SL2R, then I can find a rational matrix and a real matrix whose product is in that open set. So the open set that I'll take is the product of SL2ZPs times some little ball. Now, really, I do mean around the identity in SL2R. Some small perturbation. Okay. So this product will contain an element, in other words, is expressible as some gamma. Embedded, embedded diagonally times some matrix M embedded in the infinite place. So this is in SL2Q, and this is in, in SL2R. That's what density means. Okay, and then we, when we put in what G1 is, 
all the way back here. So G1, let's see, can I go straight to G? Let's see if I can go straight to G. So G will be, so I have this diagonal embedding of gamma, infinite embedding of M. Then I have to multiply this stuff to the other side. So let's have the finite embedding of U inverse zero, zero, one, and the infinite embedding, which commutes with the finite embedding, the infinite embedding of X zero, zero, one. Okay, that's getting, that's, I'm sorry, I have to get rid of this first. I have to get rid of this first. You slightly abuse notation, though. You can just like invert the embeddings. I'm sorry, this should be not an inverse. Is that what you mean? Like, the reverse orders of the embeddings? Yeah, the way that they act, this one only moves. moves. Yes. And here you have G1. Well, G1 is this times this times this. Right. So push the embeddings, then you have like the... These are all matrices in the Adels. These are all in GL2 of the Adels. I guess I mean the, Which is a group. Uh, I delta and I infinity. When you pass them to the other side. Uh, I'm multiplying. Okay, so let's be let's be a little careful. Let me multiply on the left by I delta of Q001. So I'm doing that here, and I'm doing that here. So I'll multiply on the left by Q001. Okay. On the right, I had one more thing. This was G1, but I had one more thing on the right, which is this. So I want to move that to the other side. I want to move that to the other side. So I first should have multiplied. Uh, can I do this? Come with me if you want to live. Um, yeah, let me let me do it like that. But we're gonna we're gonna come back to that in just a second. Uh, I sh first should have multiplied by i infinity of epsilon infinity inverse, and then i finite of the the other epsilons epsilon p inverses. That moves these guys to that side. Now I have G1. What was G1? G1 was this with G. So I'm, I'm multiplying by the inverse of this over here. This is just something very simple. I, I don't know why I'm making a big deal out of this. I, I multiply by the finite thing on the right. I multiply by the, in, by the infinite thing on the right, but the infinite thing, uh, I can't interchange it with, uh, with other infinite things, but I can certainly interchange it with finite things. They commute, right? They're act, they're just acting in different uh, components. What things are you saying? Uh, embeddings into I infinity as opposed to embeddings into the finite places. Right. Products of those commute. Because of the way instead of separate things. Yeah. Okay. So now what have we done? We've written G. Let's let's see. So G is I. Uh, so so this the product of these two things. Well, this was an SL two Q. This is not an SL2Q, so the product is something in GL2Q. So is in the embedding of GL2Q. The finite embedding is it just identity on the real place? And then the finite embedding is identity in the real place. And then whatever you say at the other places. Whatever you say. I mean, U is an infinite list already. And then here, I have something in GL2R, so times some element of GL2R embedded at infinity. And then what do I have here? These guys, these guys are all in SL2P. So are their inverses. This is in SL2P, SL2ZP. These guys are not in SL2ZP, but they're still in GL2ZP. So, so I can take the products times the, the product, well, the finite embedding of the product of uh, GL2. I mean, there's no reason to do a, a different embeddings. There's a, there's, a, um, there's a GL2R cross, a product over primes, GL2ZP. You're just saying oh, oh. Yes, I can make this, I can, I can uh, realize G inside a product like this. Okay, a summary, summary, 
all G in GL2A, there exists, can I call this gamma, even though it used to be called gamma before? There exists a gamma in uh, GL2Q. And uh, such that, let's say such that, gamma, a gamma inverse, I guess, times G, and here I mean the diagonal embedding of gamma inverse times G, is in GL2R cross a product over the primes GL2Z. Okay, so does that mean that the quotient of GL2 of the Adels mod GL2Q, diagonally embedded, is this product? So, a fun, is that a fundamental domain? Right, exactly, uniqueness. Right, I can get in here, but is it is it unique? So is it desirable in a sense because it's working with intuitively? Um, it would be an intuitive place to work at. Hello. Why can't I draw? Mm -hmm. It's responding, it's just not drawing. It's moving, it's changing. Hmm. It can undo, but it can't erase. I don't think it's a problem with this. There we go. Um. Uh, okay, so uh, so is this is this a fundamental domain, right? Is this unique? Is this decomposition unique? Is this is this representation? So let's say we have some matrix. I don't know what to call it. Let's call it M for lack of a better word. Is is the representation is the representation representation of G as iota infinity of gamma times M in here unique? or essentially unique up to sets of measure zero? The answer is gonna be no. And there'll be very good reason for it. Okay, so if... Uh, I mean, we don't get to choose convenience. It's, it's the truth, whatever whatever it is, it is. No, you'll see actually, there's very good reason. For it. Uh, if we have another, if another representation of G as iota of gamma prime times M prime, Then, then what? If these two things are equal, let me multiply on the left by this inverse. So iota, the diagonal embedding of gamma inverse times gamma prime. And I'll multiply on the right by M inverse is equal to M times M prime inverse. If these two things are equal, I multiply on the right by M prime inverse. I multiply on the left by gamma inverse. And these two things are, are, are the same. Now, both of these are subgroups. Ah, go away. Both of these are subgroups, right? This is a subgroup. You multiply by things in, in, in here. You This is going to be in uh, GL2R cross a product of GL2ZPs. Because this, because each of these is. But this is also a subgroup. GL2Q is also a subgroup, diagonally embedded. So it's also going to be intersect the diagonal embedding of GL2QP, uh, GL2Q. And what's the intersection? What's the overlap? That's exactly the question of how much redundancy is there. Can you repeat my intersection again? Well, this matrix is in this group. This matrix is in this group, and the two are equal. So how can you have a rational matrix that embeds into GL2ZP for every P? Exactly. There's no denominators, exactly as before. That implies this matrix has no denominators. Otherwise, it, it some, it's, if it has a single denominator, at some place P, we wouldn't be in ZP. That means that uh, 
gamma inverse times gamma prime is in GL2Z because GL2Z is this is the intersection. Okay, so uh, so now I think it's clear if if these two things so this quotient so now I can state a theorem theorem what we've proved is that a fundamental domain a fundamental domain for GL2A mod the action of GL2Q and I'm going to stop putting the iotas now because I think it's overkill and I think we we know what what everything means is the set GL2R mod GL2Z up to GL2Z GL2R mod GL2Z in the real place cross GL2ZPs product over primes over all primes GL2ZPs this intersection is the identity. Yes. If you remove this one ambiguity, now you have now you have matrices. The only thing they can differ by is GL2Z. So if you mod out by GL. In other words, if you fix some fundamental domain for this. Like circle. This is like, well, it's not like the circle. It's like the real line. If you look back here, let me just grab this. Uh, right? Oh, we're looking at the Where is it? It's, what happened? Copy. And paste. Hello. Why can't I copy? Sorry. What? What do you mean I can't copy? Of course I can copy. What is this? No, don't do that. <laughs> Undo. You can like probably move it manually. But I don't want to move it. I want to copy it. Yeah. Did it work? Oh, it. Maybe it did. Okay. <laughs> so the point is just compare to what happened. Yeah, that we're looking at R mod Z multiplicatively. Well, uh, so compare, compare to this alternate formulation of the of what we knew, which was that this is this. It's literally the same thing. Um, can I make you smaller. Okay, so it's literally the same. Thing, we just didn't think of it that way. This is a fundamental on the right. This is a fundamental domain for is a mod q. A cross mod q cross. Yes, and in the same way. So this is not finite volume. This this is zero to infinity. This part is all compact. Zp crosses, but this is zero to infinity. Is not finite volume. And in the same way, this quotient is not finite volume. So for GLN, this. Replace yes, yes. So Ho hopefully now you see that. Yes, this is one of the, the, those things where what we do for for uh, you know we first saw it for the edels, but now we're seeing the GL two, and and this is a pattern that's going to repeat. The notation didn't make that much sense, so it didn't. That's right. That's sort of question. So you didn't too much there, or just that Okay, so this is a very good question, actually. Either way, you want to think about it. You can either have GL2 just act in the first part, which is what I've written here, and then this, or GL2 can also act on all of these, and either one is a fundamental domain, because GL2 acting on these doesn't change it. Doesn't change the fact that you're in GL2ZP. So what I've written is actually the, the, the infinite embedding of this quotient across all of these. But you could just as well have said GL2R cross a product of GL2ZPs and have this act diagonally on everybody and have that be a fundamental. Really the right because yes. You don't do it. In the same way, I mean, in the same way that you can think of four, four, matri four elements of the Adels and a two by two matrix of that, or matrices where each element is in its uh, 
in its local field. No, I don't really like GM rules, but Okay, so so let's uh alternate alternate version, alternate version of this theorem is that if you take GL2A and you mod out not only by GL2Q, but also by the center. This Z is for centrum, center, right? Z is the center. What's the center? Z is the center. The center is just the diagonal. The things that commute with everybody. That's right. So if you mod out by these and by these, but it commutes with everybody. Okay, so what am I allowed to do on this side? Well, I've already got it just by using GL2Q. I've got it down to here. And so by using uh, all of these, uh, so, so I can, I can comment by using a diagonal element, I can make, um, so this will be uh, the same thing just with SLs. In fact, let's do, let's go one step further. Let's mod out on the right by the maximal compact in each. So this will be O cross O2, o let's say O2, the orthogonal group O2R. And, the and, and all of these uh, G, uh, GL2 ZPs, this will be literally SL2R mod SO2 mod SL2Z, also known as the upper half plane mod SL2Z. So, nature of the theorems you get out of this? No, it's just, it, it, it's just to make it finite volume. The point is that this is now a finite, finite volume quotient. Yes. 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 We, we really have done nothing. We've done something extremely fancy. To get back to the modular surface. Okay. It is because one of the things that you can do, so if you don't mod out by this, by, but by some alternate uh, compact groups, or uh, there, there are a number of choices you can make here so that this quotient will, won't come out to all of SL2Z, but it will come out to some congruence groups. You also, uh, when you have, when you, if you don't mod out by things on the left, and you go, go back to the, the GL2, but still mod out by the center. So that you still have a, once you mod out by the center, this is already a finite volume quotient. This by itself is already a finite volume quotient when you mod out by the center. The problem is in the same way that, I, I mean, GL2R and, and GL2Z, GL2Z is not a lattice in GL2R. SL2Z is a lattice in SL2R. The determinant is just too big. The determinant is, uh, you know, has this zero to infinity range. But if you can control the determinant by modding out by the center, then this quotient is already finite volume. Interesting. And so you're saying what, why? Okay, so if you do that and you don't do the other thing, then... that's that, so then you can think about the right. You see, when you when you're taking the right regular representation, you don't want to also be modding out on the right. We have to check the compatibility. Exactly. So if you leave it here, now you have the ability to act on the right. And H mod SL2Z, but it's still it's practically H mod SL2Z up to some compact things. Okay. So we're getting closer and closer to automorphic uh, representations. So once we have quotients like this, I can say what an automorphic form. Well, I can almost say what an automorphic form is. In fact, maybe I maybe I do want to talk about L functions today and come back to uh, the full definition of this, which will in order to really explain what will happen to automorphic representation, I think we do need to appreciate heck operators as opposed to just seeing them pop out of nowhere in this description. I think it's important to see classically what happens to heck operators, what happens to invariant differential operators, how the Lie algebra will act by differential operators, where we get the Casimir operator appearing as the Laplacian. Okay, there's a couple of things I wanna do before I... Look at well, the point is the HECA operators here will be so simple, you won't even notice that they're HECA operators. So if you don't know where they're where they came from, it's just diagonal multiplication. 
So, so, uh, so I think, okay, let me, let me just say this sentence and then I'm gonna take a step back and do some classical L function theory and then move our way back forward. We have time, we have time, I think we have time. Okay, so what's an adelic automorphic form? At least I can start, I can start the definition just like we started the definition of a modular form and then it took us a while to actually complete it. So an adelic automorphic form uh, will be a function phi. It's a function taking values in GL2A and returning values in the complex numbers, unless we're doing something else, uh, or Nick or whoever was asking about the piatic uh, versions of these things. Um, uh, satisfying that uh, phi of gamma g is equal to phi of g, phi of g for all gamma in uh, gl to q, of course, diagonally embedded, and g in gl2 the adults. In other words, it's a function on the quotient. So I should really say, I should really say this, and that's why I wanted to understand what that is. On the um, on the center, it's going to act by character. So let's do a trivial let's do a trivial character first, and just say it also acts on the it's it's trivial on the center, just for simplicity's sake. This is not the most general adelic automorphic. So when I change things by a diagonal matrix, nothing happens. Okay, so you're asking for that one. Yes. Oh, the character what? is the equivalent of this CZ plus V to the power of uh, something? No, it's more like a Dirichlet character that can come up come out here. Literally. Well, it, it's so the center, whatever whatever this representation is going to do on the center, it'll be some character of the Adels, of the Edels. That's what you're saying. You're choosing it trivial, but this could be chosen. Yes, and it has to be trivial on the rationals because uh, I'm modding out by GL2Q. Okay, so uh, so let's start with, with that. So, so this really looks like a, a modular form or uh, something invariant. And I want it to be and an eigenfunction um, well, I, I need two more things. Uh, eigenfunction of invariant differential operators and, and some more things, and some more things and growth rates. So, so eigenfunction, let me, let me not be precise about this. I need it to be an eigenfunction. Uh, the thing to think about uh, are MOS forms or eigenfunctions of Laplacian, the hyperbolic Laplacian, or modular forms are eigenfunctions of the cauchy riemann equation, bz bar equals zero, these kinds of things. I need, to, I need it to be eigenfunction of something, and very different operators, I have to explain what that is, and uh, HECA operators, um, and I need some growth rates. Growth rates, I'm, uh, again, people talk about growth rates, but what they really want is something that's in L2. I want to be able to, L, to take L2 of G mod gamma. This is G, this is gamma. Exactly. So yes. Well, so the fact that I haven't said what happens on this side, what the K types are, means I, I allow, uh, you'll see how the, the role that the K types play in determining the weight if it is a modular form. Okay. So that's going to be on the other side. Let's. Yes, yes. I, I'm always interested in the decomposition of L2 into irreducible. That's sort of the main thing. Uh, well, well, as we were just talking about, uh, it turns out that that to me is, to my my own, my personal applications, not to number theory, uh, broadly speaking, but to my own applications, this is much more important uh, because in the situations I'm interested in, I don't have hack operators, I don't have L functions. To number theory, more broadly, it's perhaps the L functions that are that are more Crucial. So let me let me talk about L functions a little bit. So we're going to come back to this uh, to be continued. And now L functions. What sort of results were we hoping to get from generalizing this theory? It feels like we're setting a lot of stuff up. We're setting a lot of stuff up. We want to understand what the most general L functions are. We found a bunch of miracles. We by accident stumbled into, I mean, by accident, historical accidents uh, stumbled us into holomorphicity and this hyperbolic Laplacian. 
And why are these, why can't I dream up other invariant differential operators? Why can't I dream up other differential operators that would be interesting to study on these things? Because these are the ones that are that are being, that are generated by this universal enveloping algebra. Turns out to be. Turns out to be, yes. And then we, like you said before, oh, we were the rank and sell sort of stuff. We were looking for an analog to this cube symmetric thing. And then that's right. And then in order to solve that, you were moving higher up. That's right. That's right. So it's the this Langlands principle that uh, the game should be played not on the Fourier coefficients, that the Fourier expansion is not what's uh, paramount, but these Langlands Sataki parameters that occur in the L functions. That's sort of like we're trying to just, uh, that's right. Yeah. Otherwise, it's like a lot of work and a lot of setup. Right? I agree. It's a little confusing. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the classical terminology. I don't mean this automorphic form. I haven't. I haven't explained right, right. what. What. But the classical terminology is that automorphic means that when you mod out by SL two Z, for example, that you're that you really live on the quotient. That when you uh, act by SL two Z, it doesn't change anything. Okay. Modular means. Okay. So let's. So let's Modular remember. Okay. Well, that there's a C Z plus D to the K. Right. So, I just, yes. there are no holomorphic automorphic things because this quotient is compact. Yes. In fact, let's do it. Let's do it for the Ramanujan discriminant function. Okay. So let's go back to to this discriminant function. It's delta of z. Delta of z is a modular form, right? Uh, it's a has as a Q series. It's this twenty fourth power right. It's a weight twelve, uh, weight. 12 level one level one means uh there's no i'm not looking at a congruence group so uh modular form modular in fact cusp form that's, uh, level and the ability to that's right then like it's the two and then level level two yeah if it's so level is what it can if it contains uh gamma of n right ah, if it contains like like gamma 27 or something. Yep, like then it's level 27. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this product, and of course we can expand this out, right? This is Q minus 24 Q squared plus uh, 352 or something Q cubed. This is, uh, if we expand this in a series, these, these coefficients are called the Ramanujan tau function. But the point is it starts at one and Q as always is e to the two pi i and Z, right? This uh, chart at infinity okay this this delta is uh well i said weight 12 what does that mean it means the delta of gamma z acting by fractional linear transformations gamma is a b c d in sl2z is equal to c z plus d to the 12 delta of z so that's the weight 12 level one is that it, is that this holds for so for all uh, of these and for all Z in the upper hand plane, we have this, this form. Okay, how do we attach an L function? Um, I want to attach an L function to delta. How can I do that? Okay. What does it mean to, to attach an L function? It means take the coefficients of delta and stick them into, instead of a power series, put them into a Dirichlet series. Yeah, attach means convert, convert some kind of Fourier expansion. That's right. We want functional equation, analytic continuation, Euler product. Convert a Fourier expansion into a Dirichlet series. No, you can, and that's what uh, the stuff I was talking about before. It's quotients where uh, they look arithmetic, but they're actually not. And you can still, you know, there there are number theoretic questions to be answered there, and there are techniques that uh, that can be applied. So, um, so in this case. So, so what do we do? So this is, Hecke figured this out long, long ago. Hecke figured out what you do. 
you take your function. It's a function of z. Z is on the upper half plane. Maybe you want to think about it as taking values here, and then the, the rest of the values. It's not that it takes the same values, but it's determined by uh, modularity. And you integrate along a closed geodesic. In fact, the simplest closed geodesic from zero to i infinity. So if I parameterize that as i y, and I integrate from zero to infinity, then I'm integrating delta along this thing. Now I like to normalize this with a certain parameter, which I'll tell you in a second when I figure it out, times a character, y to the s, and with respect to the hyperbolic line element, which is dy over y. Yeah, remember arc length? We have the hyperbolic metric. So we have the, uh, the quadratic form at every place that tells you what eta is so that we can measure arc length. And that, and, and if I write eta as dx dy, this was dx squared plus dy squared over y squared. So the length, if we're measuring lengths, it's the square root of this, but there is no dx, dx isn't changing. So it's just dy over y. Yeah, we have a straight vertical line. So, so if you have some other random non-vertical geodesic, then you have to yes. Uh, in fact, there are times where you want to do something. Uh, I have a paper with Duby Kelmer about how to get uh, L functions out of different kinds of integrals by, by exploiting the equidistribution of shears, for example. You can get second moments of uh, L functions. Okay, let me, let me, this is really going, uh, going off topic. Um, okay, so let's compute this integral. I have to put in what power I want here. I think it's 11 halves. Let me put 11 halves and I'll, and I'll tell you why that's there in, in a minute. It's very much related to the weight and it's very much related to the growth rate. So Ramon, the Deline's theorem, let me remind you Deline's theorem that tau of n is at most, well, some constant depending on epsilon times tau to the uh, times uh, n to the 11 halves plus epsilon. Um, I'm doing it for normalization. I like to, I like to always know that one is the abscissa convergence of the Dirichlet series. The functional equation is s goes to one minus s. Otherwise, yeah, the picture moves are enough. Yeah, it's just my preference. Some people like to have uh, normalizations just in terms of the coefficients. I like to divide by the growth rate of the coefficient and have a sequence which has base, base maps of value one to make a Dirichlet series out of it. I think this will do it. Let's see. Okay. Again, this is just a Mellon transform. This is just a Mellon transform. Integral, character, par measure. This is a Mellon transform. Oh, of delta instead of a theta function, it's it's delta. And for a theta function, we have Poisson summation. This plays the role, this modularity, let me point out, modularity is the replacement of Poisson summation. In this case, you can actually prove this modularity from Poisson summation. So it's not even a genuine replacement. But when we go to general uh, automorphic forms, really functions on this quotient, it will be the modularity or automorphy. Yes. That's right. Okay, so let's see. So let's see what we get. Okay, so I'm taking this integral. Uh, it's an integral from zero to infinity. Now, okay, we have to see a little bit about the growth rate. Let, let's do it. With, let's let's forget about growth rates. Let's uh, pretend we don't have to worry about convergence. In this case, we don't, and uh, see what we get. Okay, so sum as n goes from one to infinity. It's a cusp form. Yes, at infinity we're we're fine. What happens at zero? We have to think about it for a second, and, and you'll see that it still has uh, exponential decay. Um, Q to the n is e to the two pi i. Well, Q to the n is e to the two pi i n z. Q is e to the two pi i z. So Q to the n is e to the two pi i n z. And when I apply this at i y, I get e to the minus two pi n y. There's no x. Okay, so that's this, that's delta. Then I'm multiplying by y to the 11 halves for some strange reason. And then I'm multiplying by the character y to the s dy over y. Of course, I'm gonna interchange orders. 
I'll justify that later. In fact, I can only do that if the real part of S is bigger than one, as, as it will turn out. I mean, you originally found on how, and then when for n greater than one, that is exponential decay is for the e. Yes, what about at zero? I might be worried here if, if something's happening. Okay. Um, so I have a sum n at least one tau of n, an integral from zero to infinity. Now, what do I want to do with this integral? I want to make this look like e to the minus y. I know what's e to the minus y times the power. So I'll make a change of variables. I'll replace y by y over two pi n. Par measure won't change anything here. Here, I'll just get the, the same y to the 11 halves and the same y to the s, dy over y, there's just going to be a factor of 2 pi n to the 11 halves plus s in the denominator. So I'm going to write that as 2 pi to the minus s plus 11 halves and an n to the minus s plus 11 halves. I'm going to write this in a funny way just to separate out the role of the coefficients being of size one. And this, and here's my Dirichlet series. Yeah. So that's exactly what a Mellon transform does. A Mellon transform converts Fourier type expansions into Dirichlet series. Okay, and what is this integral? Gamma. Hopefully remember that this is just the definition of gamma of S plus 11 times. This is what I'll call the L function of the modular form of the discriminant times S. And then of course, this is the, the completed, this last bit is just the, the infinite place of that L function. That's just normalization. And you'll see in a second where, where that comes in. Okay, let's worry for us. Any questions so far? This computation makes sense? We, we didn't do anything. Okay, so let's see why that. So, um, fine. Yes, I want to define the L function as tau of n over n to the 11 halves as the Fourier coefficient over n to the s as the Dirichlet series, which of course is the same thing as n to the s plus 11 halves down here. And when you okay. said that, you said that convergence really does happen. That's right. Knowing that this is bounded by n to the epsilon. If you allow me to lean, then this has this L function has obsessive convergence. Uh, S, you know, in if I put absolute values here, this does grow like n to the epsilon for any epsilon. So I can pull the uh, I, this. I can make sense. This has absolute convergence as so, as long as S uh, real part of S is greater than one. Okay, so you think the line is still at one part, right? That's right. Although I haven't proved that for you yet because I haven't given you a functional equation. So let's work out the functional equation. So if I go back to this formula and I make a change of variables, y goes to one over y. Once you have another product of the following, one how that is, you don't have crazy stuff happening with the zeros. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, there's a variety of ways of doing this. Um, yeah, sure. Let's uh, let's just replace y by uh, one over y. Why do I want to do that? So note the modularity says if I have delta of zero negative one one zero acting on i y. On one hand, that's equal to well, that's just delta of uh, z goes to negative one over z negative one over i y is i over y. That's just from what the fractional linear action is. Uh, but modularity says this is going to be equal to c, z plus d. c is 1, z is i, y, plus d is 0, to the 12th power times delta of z. z is i, y. Okay, so i, y, I'm on this, I'm on this geodesic. So then, 
Yes. Okay. So one one thing to one thing we can see from this. This is what I was saying before. Why don't we have a problem at infinity? We don't have a problem because we have exponential decay times some polynomials. How about at zero? It's a cusp form. So at zero, we also don't have a problem because we do have polynomial growth times exponential decay. So there's no. Uh, so we have. So this implies that we have exponential decay. Both as y goes to infinity and as y goes to zero. So this thing is actually an entire function. Not when I start opening it up. When I start opening it up, I have to be careful because I'm going to get a series. So I'm sort of ruining the convergence by putting in the definition. That's why you're like analytic degree. Exactly. OK, so if I replace y by, so I'm going to go back to this, this definition and replace uh, all the way to here. And I'll make a change of variables. So I'll replace y by 1 over y. So I'll still have an integral from 0 to infinity. I'll have a delta of i over y. I'll have a y to the minus 11 halves, y to the minus s, dy over y, which changes by a minus sign that allows me to replace the zero and infinity back to what they were. OK. Um, and, and what is this? We just said what this is. This is the integral from zero to infinity. Y to the i to the 12 is 1. 12 is a multiple of 4. Y to the 12 is y to the 12. So I have uh, delta i y. Y to the 12, well, let me just leave it there, times y to the minus 11 halves. And now I see that I did do it right, in fact, because 12 is 24 halves. Is the power word the multiple of four and only multiple of two, then you get a negative. That's right. Is that no, that would be if that's the root number of that functional equation. So if you took a weight, uh, instead of weight 12, if you took a weight uh, 20, 18, thank you. 18, 20 is still a multiple. 22 is what I had in mind. Yeah, 18, something that's two mod four instead of, uh, zero mod four, then it would have a minus sign in its functional form. Yeah. There you go. But that won't be a heck of a thing. You want a heck of a thing, right? So, so uh, why did I say I got the uh, that I got the um, normalization right? Twelve is twenty four halves minus eleven is thirteen halves. Thirteen halves is eleven halves with an extra one left over. That's the functional equation. This is exactly the same thing as we had before, except instead of y to the s, we have y to the 1 minus s. So this completed L function, if you want to call this whole thing the completed L function of delta at s, we just proved that it's the same as the completed del uh, L function of delta at 1 minus s. And what you said is that in general, when you have some root number. You That's right. Minus. That's right. There could be a, a you know i to the i to the weight. I mean, in, in modern form, it's just a positive number. That's right. More generally, when you have, uh, you can have more general modularity where there's also a character here. So if there's a character here, you could get things like uh, uh, Gauss sums, and yeah, it could be more more complicated. Yeah. Okay. So, so. This is an instance where we can really just write down quite explicitly what uh, the coefficients are. I can work them out. I can write out the Q series, and that means I can write out the L function. And it will have analytic continuation. It'll have an analytic continuation because this already is an entire function of S. I have exponential decay at zero and at infinity. So whatever the power is, right? Mm -hmm. You can also do it the way we did with the zeta function, where you break this into an integral from 0 to infinity to 0 to 1 and 1 to infinity. On the integral from 0 to 1, you apply uh, y goes to 1 minus y. 
uh, if you if you so choose. But there's there's actually no reason to do that. Okay, does that make sense? So we have a functional equation. We have an analytic continuation. Do we have an Euler point? Okay, so the thing that I have to explain to you is, do we have an Euler product? But actually, I'm going to postpone this discussion for just a second. So to be continued, because I want to tell you what's going to happen for MOS forms. What about MOS forms where we, where we can't, I mean, just the mere existence of MOS forms is, is uh, rather non-trivial. Like, what if we try to do this computation? This yes, form? what would happen? Yeah, what is this, comp how do we get an L function out of a MOS form? Then you have like, you have uh, automorphism, but no decay. You still have decay because you're in L2. It's not as strong. You, it turns out if you're cuspidal, you will have strong decay in exactly the same way. This is where cuspidality plays a crucial role. And in that case, like it just goes through. That's right, with some uh, modifications. And those modifications, I'm trying to work up to uh, this. Where have we used? There's a secret place where we used this differential equation. Where was it? Yes. The fact that this is e to the 2 pi i z used the Cauchy Riemann equations. That's where this, that's where this uh, eigenfunction uh, is hiding. So we're, here, it won't be hiding. We'll need it absolutely explicitly. Because it, it's all we have when we go to Moscow. So I want to, I think that's a, an important point to pause on before we go on to, uh, this is going to be due to HEC operators. So I, I owe you HEC operators. So you're saying like, oh yeah, you have like vessel functions. And like, exactly, that's exactly. Like, uh, eigenvalue of these. Exactly. exactly. So, so what is this? What? How do we get L functions? How to get L functions from MOS forms? Okay. So suppose, uh, what should I call it? F, P, F. F is a MOS form. So F is a function. Let's just go upper half plane mod SL2Z. Let's make it as, as simple as possible to C, and it's an eigenfunction, eigenfunction of um, the hyperbolic Laplacian, y squared. This delta is not that delta. We're used to lots of notation clashing and not being scared by that. And also, like, this bump doesn't do it. It's like he doesn't even mention like delta. He's like, here are the vessel functions, and everything works nicely with them. He, he does. He does. It's just not. He talks about it later. Later, yeah, yeah. Uh, do these even exist? And and I want and I want f to be an L two uh, h mod. Let me write gamma if you don't. Okay. Uh, aside, not not really aside, but do these even exist? Do these even exist? Well, we have we have theorems. We have Viles law that's self proved this from the trace formula, you develop the trace formula in order to show that they, they do. So yes, uh, but their coefficients, unlike tau where they're, these are whole numbers we count on our fingers, these are transcendental numbers, presumably. Does that mean that there is a number theory data in it? Yes, because there'll be eigenfunctions of HECA operators. In fact, that's one way to, to help your numerics is to force the HECA operators into the coefficients and, and see if you're still getting modularity, automorphism. Okay, so, so let's come back to that. Um, great, we have invariance as before, F of X plus IY plus one is equal to F of X plus IY. So we still have an expansion in the X variable, some coefficients A, N of Y, e to the 2 pi i and x. I want to know what it is in z. And it's not going to be something uh, elementary. Yeah. Yeah. So the fact that this is an eigenfunction of now the second order differential operator instead of Cauchy Riemann, which is a first order. So uh, delta f, 
which should be lambda f. So let's write it as delta minus lambda. Yeah, sure. How do you know you mess around with the Laplace? Okay. Uh, the Laplace Beltrami operator is some general in Ramanian geometry. There's always a Laplacian whenever you have uh, Ramanian structure. So some vacuum first. Then it's like, oh, let's look at this and this piece. Um, pretty much, pretty much, yeah. Ramanian by the by the time that Selberg was was looking at this, it was clear that this was the right. Uh, it's just number theory point of view, right? Like this is might look a little bit random, like uh, from a distance. Right? Yeah, you need to know some Ramanian geometry to know. If you do, then it seems like yeah. I mean, this is the. Uh, Again, we're, uh, I'm sort of avoiding talking about uh, invariant differential operators, but that's where, where, where should I say what, what those are? Like, okay, let's keep going, let's keep going, yeah. I, I get sidetracked. Okay, delta F, delta F. So I'm gonna apply this differential operator. So I'm gonna take, uh, delta F is supposed to equal to lambda F, lambda F, right? That's what it means to be an eigen. Uh, and let me make this, uh, I wanna put a minus sign here. I do wanna put a minus sign here. So that I have something that's. that's no, it's just to, so that my eigenvalues are positive instead of negative. With the minus sign there, this thing is uh, is positive definitely. Okay, so what is the Laplacian? So it's a linear operator, so it's going to act term by term. I multiply by y by negative y squared. I take two derivatives in x. Two derivatives in x bring down a four pi squared, n squared with a minus sign, plus two derivatives in y, two derivatives in y is, well, it is whatever it is, a n double prime y, times e to the two pi i n x. You're asking for these coefficients to be twice the derivative? Uh, yes, this is gonna be a smooth, Smooth function. Okay. So once we get existence, then like, you know, we can do it. Okay, yeah. This we were asking for too much. Yeah. Yeah. I want I want eigenfunctions. I mean, these the fact that they're eigenfunctions is gonna make them smooth. So the fact that this is equal to lambda f, which means on the other hand, it's also equal to just the constant lambda times these coefficients a n of y e to the two pi i n x. Well, two series agree everywhere, if and only if their coefficients, their, their Fourier coefficients would be. And so now we get a, a, a system, system of uh, second order ordinary differential equations. There's no partial, uh, we sort of, we're separating variables, right? We're separating variables and using this periodicity. Yeah. So this is second order ODE, on the coefficients on a n of, uh, of one. And what is that ODE? It says that, well, it's right here. I mean, I could write it again or I could just do that. That's the second order ODE. This is, right, and you're saying this is what it means to be like an eigenfunction. That's right. Okay, so the fact that it's an eigenfunction means that its coefficients satisfy the second order ODE. Now there are two solutions. Uh, it turns out, turns out that there are, uh, it's a second order ODE, usually you know, nth order equations have n independent solutions, so that there are uh, two independent solutions that arose in other contexts previously, and they're called the I vessel function, I and K, these are the traditional names, vessel functions. You can solve this directly up to the integral. So, oh yeah, up to the integral, but these would be like really high. Right? There's a wide variety of, uh, you can solve this. You can take a, a, a series expansion for an, then you'll get a series uh, realization. These are This is how you do like two hyperbolic 2F1 hypergeometric functions. But if you, right. There's so a general if, theory of. Then realizing those is what we're going to want to be kind of hard, right? If you expand the series, you, you will see that it's a 2F1, that it's a special case of a 2F1. You know what I'm talking about? A, a Gauss hypergeometric 2F1. 
two F one A B C Z. This is a yeah Gauss hypergeometric function. This is the part of uh, analytic number theory where you go into like this this stuff that all analytic number theorists do all the time, and anyone who's not in like this is like, how do you even know about these things? Oh, does everybody know about these things? It's, it's a very esoteric subject, except for analytic number theorists, where it's like a you know central thing that everybody knows. Um, nothing esoteric in the age of YouTube. In the age of YouTube, yes, nothing's esoteric. Yep, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this is a this is a series in, in terms of Pockheimer symbols. So it's like uh, a n b n over c n. Uh, z to the n, something like this, where the, these symbols, you, you know what this means, a, a n means a times a minus one, and it's like the Gauss uh, following, factorial. following factorial, yeah, a minus n. Yeah, n factorial here, thanks. The two and the one is that there's two on top and one on bottom, and then there's, you know, Four F threes and, and there's that's exactly right. And you can even so. do this to like show irrationality of e. Like that's right. Yeah. These things like are so one, uh, not one. Uh, I mean, e is just one over n factorial summation one over n factorial. So that's one way to approach it. It's irrational. Anyway, um, so so here's what happens. You have these two uh, functions, the i bessel function and the k bessel function. The k bessel function, k bessel, and I'll give you formulas for these. I want to derive these formulas, which I, I can't do in four minutes. Uh, the k bessel function has exponential decay. Exponential decay as y goes to infinity, and the i bessel has exponential growth as y goes to infinity. Yeah, the symmetry. You know, replacing y with one over y? Uh, replacing s with negative s. s. It's, it's, uh, it's subtle. It mean, no, it's, I mean, what I'm thinking about is going about like, not lying on to it. You know, oh, oh, in the there's an integral representation of yeah, the K Bessel. Right. Yes, yeah. the K Bessel. Okay, so the K Bessel. Uh, gosh, I want to tell you so many things about this. Um, K Bessel is, is what? Black box. Get to the alpha function. Get to the alpha function. Fine. Black box. So, um, I mean, uh, not this view. Of it. Okay. So, so when you solve this this ODE. What you learn is that f, right? You, we, we know what this thing is. It's some linear combination of k's and i's. So f, so f of x plus i y is some a n times, it turns out it's y to the one half k um, s minus a half. So lambda, the eigenvalue lambda, we can write as s times one minus s. That's uh, Selberg's. Uh, Notation, and if you do, then then uh, the normalization of the k Bessel function is uh, two pi n y. Um, so that's this plus some co some other unknown coefficient y to the one half the i Bessel function s minus a half two pi n y times e to the two pi i n x. Mm -hmm. Why am I going to toss out the i? Because if I want f to be an L2, L2 of h mod gamma, remember h mod gamma is, is a fundamental domain like this. In particular, it contains a fundamental domain like this. And so the fact that the integral of f squared over a fundamental domain is finite, I'll make this even smaller by integrating just from minus a half to a half in X and from one or 10, whatever, to infinity dy over y squared. Now over y squared, because this is the invariant measure on, on the upper half plane, right? Har measure dx dy over y squared, uh, norm f squared, norm f squared. And this 
again by Parseval will be a sum of squares of these things, absolute value. Now, this is what happens at the end of every lecture. I start rushing, and then it's a sum over n in z of the absolute value squared of the a n y to the one half k plus the b n y to the one half i. The fix y is defined, right? but like when you start integrating over them, you're in and if if any of these b n's is not zero, this has exponential decay. Exponential growth at infinity. Okay, so the fact that it's finite implies that all the bn's are zero. Just all fine, right? it's linear combinations of these really solutions to differential equations, but you can just choose one of them instead of a. That's right. So, so this is the multiplicity one. What we'll see is multiplicity one of Whitaker models. So this is multiplicity one. Bless you. So this is. Uh, multiplicity one, even though I have an nth order differential equation, I have to throw away all but one of the possible solutions. This is, general, this is what happens, this is what happens in, in, in some great generality. Yes, not always, but and in general, are you able to find formulas for you want to avoid such formulas as much as possible? Yes, you want general reasons for the for these things. Here it's, uh, I mean, it, I haven't defined I, so the fact that I'm pulling out a factor of y to one half is a historical uh, thing. So it doesn't matter whether it's there or not. The it's polynomial and this is blowing up exponentially. So the point is this isn't there. The point is that F, that we, that we have an expansion of F x plus I y as a sum over N in Z of some coefficients unknown coefficients times y to the one half k vessel two pi n y e to the two pi i n x. Now, if f is a cusp form, well, uh, so what, what cusp form will mean is that if I integrate uh, f of x, this integral comes out to zero. But that's just the zeroth Fourier coefficient. That means that a zero is zero. In the same way, when we had Dirichlet L functions as opposed to the zeta function, the theta functions for without a Dirichlet twist, we had to take out, we, we did not have things that were entire, we had things that were uh, meromorphic. Right. So again, here you're saying like the k vessel function is nice. It's going to give us convergence granted, like. Right. I should have said this is, a is zero. Th this entire calculation, by the way, assumes that n is not equal to zero. There is no, I mean, otherwise, uh, otherwise I'm getting the constant. Yeah. So this is for n not equal to zero. Yeah. Okay. There's a separate solution to the, if n is equal to zero, what does it mean that n is equal to zero, by the way? If n is equal to zero, yeah, I'm out of time. If n is equal to zero, the solution is uh, y to the s and y to the one minus s. Um, all right, to be continued, then you can make an L function. Then you can make an L function. Yeah, we're gonna recurse, <laughs> we're gonna recurse into loose ends and then recurse back up to you know, to, to GL2, the Adels, and, and see the Hecke theory and see why you get L functions and why those L functions factorize and uh, all that good stuff. I mean, my favorite